Welcome, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Emotionally Focused Couples Therapy. This is Dr. Diane Gayhart. I know that EFT is definitely one of the most popular um, approaches, certainly in the area of marriage and family therapy, but I would say even broadly in general in psychotherapy. So, um, but uh, yeah, so lots of interest in emotionally focused couples therapy. It is certainly one of the leading approaches in the field of psychotherapy. And so I am so, so happy to be here with you and um, to just talk about this very important approach in the field. And as you probably know, emotionally focused um, therapy really began with a focus on couples. It's really, it's one of the two leading uh, couples approaches that are, have a ev strong evidence base to it. And, and so it's very well respected as a couples therapy approach. But in the last several years, it has also really been advanced both in the area of family as well as working with individuals. So, but tonight we're gonna, we are gonna be, there's most of the focus, most of the research is on the couples, but we'll be talking about all the different ways you can use EFT. And this approach that really has revolutionized so much in the field. So let's go ahead and get started. So if you're not familiar with my textbooks, I always like to have a section on, in a nutshell, the least you need to know. I have heard feedback that students who read the textbook love this, this section. Uh, a lot of the professors are like, the least you need to know, really, Diane? But the idea here is let's just start with the big picture, get a sense of a uh, what is this approach all about? So emotionally focused therapy is definitely one of, is one of the two leading um, couples approaches, especially in terms of being an evidence-based treatment for working with couples. It is a validated treatment, meaning that there has been research that it gets above average results when you use EFT. So it is a um, very strong evidence base for EFT. Now, so when you look at EFT, especially when you compare it to some other approaches, it is really focusing on the emotional level of the system. And so we are focusing on and conceptualizing what's going on um, between people, um, looking at emotions, and it has both an intrapsychic and an interpersonal, meaning it addresses what's going on within the person, intrapsychic, and interpersonal, what's going on between people. It addresses both levels. It is a generally considered a brief approach. So 70 to 73% of couples um, who are in clinical trials. So this is much more tightly focused usually than um, your you know, treatment as usual. Um, but um, 70 to 73% um, get better usually within 12 to 15 sessions, um, meaning that there is no longer any what's considered clinical distress as it's defined, you know, with uh, measures for a couple distress. And, and most couples, 86% will say that there is significant improvement within 12 um, sessions. So significant improvement may not meet that threshold for um, no longer being clinically distressed, um, so it's got very impressive outcomes in controlled clinical trials, but I will tell you in the real world, you know, normally the outcomes aren't quite this, uh, quite this good, but it is still, I would say, one of the most efficient ways to work with couples. And no one told me this in grad school, so I'm going to tell it to you if you're in graduate school listening to this, but uh, generally um, people will say that um, Working with couples is probably the toughest work you can do, I would say, in the field of psychotherapy. And so it really, if this is an area you want to work with couples, I strongly recommend you get formal training in an approach like um, EFT so that you can work um, with couples, which, which can be very, very challenging and difficult. So let's go ahead and get started. Oh, yeah. So... Um, yeah, so most of the research has been done on couples, and there is more work being done with families and even more recently with individuals. So if you're familiar um, with my unifying framework for psychotherapy, you know that I synthesize all of the, re uh, all of the literature and approaches into a single framework, and that there are four different levels that approaches can work on, and each level has two parts. 
Um, and so when you look at EFT, what you're going to notice is that the EFT really focuses all of its interventions and conceptualizations on the emotional level of what's going on between people. Now, this doesn't mean there's no cognition or emotion or societal narratives addressed at all. It just means when you, with this approach, you're focusing in on that emotional level. And more specifically, they are very focused in on what they call primary emotions, which are attachment-based emotions. So, um, emotions that relate to a feeling of emotional safety in relationships. So this is the level that EFT really focuses on. And you'll also see, I mean, they do obviously talk about behaviors, but with more so than tracking the interaction cycle like they might in a traditional strategic or structural family therapy approach or even a CBT approach, in this approach, they are focusing a lot on the complementary patterns, particularly um, the pattern of pursuer and distancer. I will tell you one of the things I just loved when I um, first learned about EFT is how I really believe Sue Johnson has taken some of the most con difficult concepts in family therapy and really streamlined them and made it easier to use. And so she focused, she just says, focus on who's pursuing for connection and who's distancing, the pursuer and the withdrawal. Very um, classic um, way of looking at systems. And I think she just really made it more simple. So you're looking at complementary patterns, you know, and the primary attachment emotions or what the what the focus is. Now that's, you know, in this approach. So there's a lot less cognitive processing or going into societal discourses. Obviously there's some of that, but that's not the focus of the interventions and the conceptualization of this approach. So the juice. So the juice, um, as you will know from notice in my books, I talk about the juice, which is the most significant contribution that this approach gives to the field. And so I highlight this in all of my textbooks, both in traditional counseling theories as well as family therapy theories. So, you know, to just highlight that no matter what approach you are using, there are core ideas, I think, from each um, different theoretical model that we all can benefit from. And I just try to highlight that um, in this section called the juice. So what Sue Johnson did what that was so revolutionary is that um, she really developed and implemented and applied. And really, I would say is by far the leader in applying and a, and a model for attachment for adults. And prior to Sue Johnson's work, uh, most of the work around attachment was focused on children and, and really children zero to five for the most part, right? It's when we, so we used to talk about attachment with the little, you know, little kids and, and their, you know, early attachment uh, needs, you know, and, and really early childhood primarily, you know, somewhat into the elementary years and such and even, but it was really a childhood concept. And what Sue Johnson did is she really looked at even adults we have this need for a secure attachment. I, I sometimes try to explain it to my clients is we're herd animals, you know, and we need to have that safe primary attack. We need to have the safe little group. And, and so that is what attachment is. These attachment figures are our are, are little herd of safety, our little tribe of safety. And adults need this just as much as children. We know in the research that, you know, young infants, there's a failure to thrive. There is a failure to literally survive without an attachment figure. And so adults don't die without an attachment figure, but they are not happy. And they certainly are on their worst behavior when they feel that attachment is threatened. So we're all, when we feel that secure, our attachment um, relationships are threatened, we all get our trigger, stress response triggered and we tend to not um, be on our worst behavior. And that is often why I would say couples therapy becomes some of the more difficult approach because it triggers people at such a primal level of, of feeling threatened in their relationship. Okay. So, so yeah, so, and, and there is medical research that really does support that we need attachment and that it affects our physical health, our mental health. Um, and so it really is something that we're beginning to understand much better in terms of how adults need this sense of emotional safety. And so, and as you know, as we talk through this and you will see that I really have come to believe that um, that adult attachment uh, theory really helps explain why often 
in our families and couple relationships, it's very puzzling that the people we love the most are often the ones we are most likely to hurt the most deeply, to be the most cruel or hurtful, to say some of the worst things in the world to. We will often say things to our, a loved one, a family member, or a partner that we would never say to a stranger. And isn't that interesting about human psychology? Why do we do that? And I, I think this theory and Sue's concept of adult attachment really helps us understand that in a way that we can be um, more useful to our clients. Okay. See folks joining from all the world. Just saw Jamaica go by. We've got Florida. Awesome. Awesome to have you all here. So uh, Sue Johnson uh, has 10 tenets of her related to this theory of adult attachment and adult Love New Zealand coming in Myrtle Beach. Wow, you got this is fun. I want to have Florida, Myrtle Beach, New Zealand. I love it. Um, sorry, uh, on the side here, I'm seeing where folks are joining from. Kay over Magura Hills. Oh my God, you're like five minutes from me. Okay, I'm getting distracted by all the cool people joining. So, hello everyone, welcome, welcome. Um, so the first uh, tenet is that it, it attachment is an innate motivating force that we are motivated to be in these relationships. Um. And that secure dependence on another person complements autonomy. It's not, you know, we're independent or dependent. These two forces, um, we need both. And it's a both and that we should be looking to balance both a sense of autonomy as well as a sense of healthy interdependence. Um, attachment offers an essential safe haven as well as what's called a secure base. And adults need these just like infants need them. Um, and that is emotional accessibility and responsiveness that builds these attachment bonds. So accessibility, meaning people can access you and that you are responsive to them. This is how you build a secure attachment. And that it is fear and uncertainty that um, activate the attachment needs. Many people would call this a trigger nowadays. They trigger us, right? When we don't feel safe in a relationship, we get triggered. Our stress response gets triggered. And um, when we feel unsafe in our primary attachment um, relationships, we feel threatened as if our life is being physically threatened. And, and, I, and when you, you do a lot of couples work, that explains so much. I remember when I really thought about this, I'm like, oh, this is why people can act so terrible in their couple relationships. Um, because it really does trigger a very kind of primal sense of safety. So the process of separation distress is predictable and there is a finite number of insecure attachment styles. Um, one is, you know, anxious or hyperactivated. You get anxious when um, the attachment is threatened. There's avoidant where you start to um, withdraw or if you feel like you're, the attachment's being threatened to protect yourself, you kind of withdraw. And then there's a combination where you will do a mix of anxious and avoidant attachment. Now, the one thing I will say, and um, and I've, I've started adding this to my textbooks because clinically this is how I experience it, because we like to say someone's securely attached or insecurely attached, you know, or they're you know they're this, they're secure or they're not. And I think it's much more useful clinically to say, you know, and to conceptualize it as any of us under enough stress, we will we will do one of these or three things. We will be anxiously attached, avoidant, or some combination thereof under enough stress. And the question really is, how much threat do we need um, to activate this kind of inattached, uh, the um, insecure attachment styles? So, and so if someone is you know, easily gets it triggered or gets a sense that the, you know, triggers are in it, um, they're insecure style, you know, that's when we typically will call them, you know, anxiously attached or avoidantly attached. But even someone who's securely attached most of the time, you know, under enough relationship stress, you will see these patterns emerge. So it's not like, oh, finally, I went to therapy for five years and I'll never have an insecure attachment moment in my life. So sorry, you will. Um, under enough stress, we can we will all do one of these things. And an interesting thing to notice um, as a couples therapist, I will tell you, is that most of us have kind of a default style based on what we did as a child. You know, were we trying to please our parents? Were we rebelling? Were we detached? You know, how do we handle this? And that kind of is our general style. But if you get into a relationship with someone um, 
you know, you may end up taking an opposite style. Like let's say two people who are anxiously avoidant end up in a relationship together, right? Well, what you can see happen is a person who's normally anxiously attached becomes avoidant to just balance out that couple system. So it can, your style can actually shift a little bit with different relationships. Um, but generally we have a style that we developed in childhood and then we bring it into all of our future relationships, you know, our couple relationships. And also in parenting, you will see these same patterns play out often in parenting as well. Um, and so and part of attachment is we have these working models in our head of have self and other. Um, and then finally, the last piece here is that isolation and loss are inherently traumatizing. And so when you have an attachment relationship or one of your primary attachment relationships where there is either isolation within that relationship or loss, that will be experienced as a form of trauma. And so even though we are not talking about physical threat to life, when you threaten someone's secure attached base, even as an adult, that is very traumatic. And, um, and so this is what this approach um, is very unique in being able to address this. And I will say I, I did Couples therapy before EFT was a thing. I remember seeing Sue at the first AAMFT conferences, you know, 20 years ago, where it was the new thing. Um, and I will say that this concept of adult attachment really helps, um, I think, helps us clinically get to the heart of uh, especially couple and family issues much faster than before we had this concept. Okay, so let's look at the big picture, which is the overview of treatment. It is, EFT is an evidence-based treatment. It is a manualized treatment for couples therapy. And so it is structured. It is a structured approach. And so there are three basic stages. The first is stage one is stabilization. And so this is where you're stabilizing the relationship and the couple. And you're establishing a, a st very strong therapeutic relationship. This, this work is very intense, and um, and you help them kind of talk, you know, understand why we're going to be exploring some of these more difficult relationships. And then you'll be developing a clear case conceptualization. We'll talk about how in just a minute using attachment theory, using systems theory, actually, and attachment together. And you are going to kind of track that interaction pattern. I think one of the interesting things about EFT is one of the basic premises is that couples, they, you know, all couples have, you know, basically one basic pattern. There can be some variations, but there's typically in most couples, there's just one basic interaction, negative interaction cycle, um, you know, how they argue, how they do their tension cycle. And, it's, and basically the dance moves are very much the same. The content can change from argument to argument to argument, but typically, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the variations, but in most cases, you're going to find there's one basic argument they're having over and over and over again. Take any topic, toothpaste, children, money, finances, sex, put it into it, and they're going to have the same type of argument. So what you're doing in the beginning is you're helping to stabilize them, creating a safety, creating safety, um, you know, in the session and then understanding and identifying that core pattern. Then in stage two, once you've done your assessment, you've built a relationship, you're going to go into restructuring. So um, the couple system. And what's interesting in this phase is that typically, assuming there's a withdrawer in the system, you're going to work by um, targeting the most withdrawn couple. Um, to get them started and, and working on helping them get reconnected um, in terms of the secure attachment. But you're helping both partners identify um, and directly express to the other their unmet attachment needs primarily. So we're really looking at that primary need um, for connection and secure attachment. And so you're, you're helping your each party express to... Um, and to identify, express, and receive, and help meet those needs. And then in stage three is what they call consolidation, where you're helping the couple learn how to interact commu and communicate in ways um, using these safe 
um, secure attached um, relationship patterns and interaction patterns. So you're learning to help the couple maintain that sense of emotional safety so that they can effectively communicate about whatever is going on. So um, let's look at the therapeutic relationship. And like, so EFT is a humanistic experiential approach. So similar, you know, in the same school as Carl Rogers, Fritz Perls, Virginia Satir, Carl Whitaker. So like all of these experiential humanistic approaches, um, the relationship, the therapeutic relationship is, um, is a core component of making the whole approach work. And it is a very emotionally attuned approach. And um, so it's a, there's this very specific way to do this well. And I would say I would say this, if you're interested in learning how to do EFT, you do need to get formal training, especially for how to do the therapeutic relationship, as well as the interventions. But compared to other theories, like let's say CBT, it's uh, I think it's easier to pull that therapeutic relationship off without formal training than it is in EFT. So making a connection to therapeutic relationship. So the therapist really is needing to attune to each person's emotions. And so it's a very emotionally intense relationship and that you have to be willing as a clinician to kind of take off your expert hat and to be very fully present in the room, emotionally present, emotionally attuned, um, and so really using what they call empathic attunement, which is listening, understanding their experience and really listening for the emotions as they are talking and really attuning to that and kind of leaning in. And, you know, there's one thing I will say, clients can sense when they are freaking you out with their emotions. <laughs> so if they have strong emotions and you feel uncomfortable with their expression of emotion, they can feel that and they will pull back. And so to do this approach well, you have to be, you have to work, I think, do a lot of work on yourself so that you can be emotionally tuned um, to your clients and then create that sense of emotional safety. And this is what, what's really called therapeutic presence. It's really hard to teach really can't do it just from a lecture like this, but you know, and that takes a lot of your self development as a therapist to be able to be that emotionally present in the room. And again, this is something clients feel. It is, um, and it is um, not something that's just like taught in an intellectual way. So and then, um, and so the one thing too that needs to happen in this approach is the therapist needs to be able to emotionally attune to both people in the room, and please wait for this, simultaneously, even if they're really mad at each other. <laughs> and it's real important. It is, um, it takes a, a lot of, I would just, I don't know why the word is right now coming to me as emotional maturity, but it takes a lot of emotional discipline and security and, and understanding and really having compassion for the human experience, right? Because it's very easy to take sides with one, one half of a couple partner and that's, that doesn't work in any form of couples therapy, right? So, you know, the therapist is being able to be empathically attuned to both people at the same time, understanding, and I, I think how you end up learning how to do this is you really begin to understand how we, you know, inadvertently, unintentionally cr can create a lot of suffering in our couple relationships. And when it, it really sinks in that couples create these patterns together, we just can't blame one person as easy as it can be sometimes to blame one half. And it doesn't mean there are abusive relationships or, or, or where there is, um, what do you call it, a clear abuse of power. But oftentimes, you know, couples are often creating these interacting action patterns together. And, and yes, there can be power imbalances, but it's also recognizing how, um, at least in most cases, you know, that the couple has created this pattern together and having a lot of compassion for how humans end up doing this over and over and over again, right? This seems to be the default setting and we have to work hard to avoid it. So there's this whole compassion for, for the couple and understanding and having empathy for each person's position in the couple. So if you um, get a chance to see Sue Johnson and other EFT colleagues at, uh, at, at work, but particularly Sue Johnson, um, she has a very specific way of relating. Um, I like to always 
you know, I, I like to joke, you know, there's a Sue Johnson lean where she's moving in, her voice is low. She, there is a way to do this work. And it is really important. You know, um, when I'm doing, you know, live supervision, um, you know, with students, you know, oftentimes one of the places I have to help them is you've got to, there's a way of talking to do any type of emotionally based intervention where your voice is slower. You are, you know, Sue, Sue Johnson does the lean um, and there's, it's slower, it's lower paced. Your, the tone of your voice is slower. And if you don't have the right vocal pacing and you talk like this, people are, you can do cognitive interventions like this, but you cannot do emotionally based interventions like this. So if you try to talk like this and do EFT, it won't work. I promise you, because, you know, when you get in to processing those attachment emotions, those are probably our most vulnerable emotions that a human can have. There is, there's a certain way that you do this. And so she uses risk, um, risk, I guess, um, no risk. There it is. Uh, I, there's an extra I. I apologize for that because I always remember. Yeah, so it's risk. So this is how um, she uses her voice and in fact her whole body and her language to help people access these more vulnerable emotions that all of us generally tend to prefer to avoid. So she repeats words and how people are feeling. She uses images because images can often convey, um, you know, um, convey a, an emotion more uh, clearly than, a, you know, just a, an adjective or a word. So, you know, talking about the weight or the burden or feeling something feels raw, you know, using, you know, using different um, uh, images, keeping the language very simple, because when people are processing very vulnerable emotions, you do not want to use lots of complex language um, and theories. You're using it slow. So she she says soft. I would and I would say add to that a lower tone is uh, I add the lower tone to this and using the client's own words, you know, like if a client saying it just feels like I'm in a dark, you know, hole all by myself, you know, or whatever it is, you're going to use their words that they just gave you, um, to to repeat and to heighten their experience so that the client can fully experience these vulnerable emotions, express them to their partners in a safe environment so that the couple can work through them. Um, so, so yeah, so you want to, um, you know, understand that the therapeutic relation, there's a very specific um, style. Okay. So genuineness and acceptance. And so this is something that actually hopefully characterizes, and I think uniquely characterizes couple and family therapy. There's one, it's one thing to be genuine and accepting with an individual. It's pretty easy. It's just you, it's just them. It's one person to focus on. And, um, but being, being genuine and accepting with a, with a couple or a family is much more challenging. Um, oftentimes your sympathies will align with one maybe more than the other. Um, and, but being able to uh, see the whole system and how it works and understand how inadvertently with the best of intentions, all of us can cr create some form of negative pattern. I don't care who you're with um, in terms of, of how we relate and how we respond when we don't feel safe in a relationship. And so it is real important in this approach, like all the other experiential approaches, that there is this real genuineness and acceptance and, and that the clients feel like they're having an authentic human encounter. You are right there with them side by side and fully human. And, and they need to feel your presence and your genuineness, um, you know, when you are working with them for them to feel safe enough to do this type of work. And so, so there's really kind of honoring um, and prizing clients as they are, you know, acknowledging who they are in their fullness, the good, bad, and the ugly, what they're capable of, and still seeing the best in them. Um, it's a very humanistic kind of way of seeing and viewing clients. And it's very important that this very positive, realistic, I would say, view of human nature um, 
and that the therapist is able to just fully embrace that yes this is someone who is struggling they're in pain when they're in pain they may not be behaving the best but understanding that that's what humans do and that they're here and you're there to help them learn how to manage those really ter scary emotions um, when they feel threatened in better ways so let's look um, at how they do case conceptualization and assessment in EFT. <clears throat> so the first thing to just know that when um, you're working with, through an EFT perspective, you are simultaneously tracking how the individual is processing their experiences, especially their attachment needs, and then interpersonally, how are they? The, how are the partners working um, or the family? Um, how are they, you know, how are they interacting? What are the patterns in their interactions? So even if you're working with an individual, you're doing the, you're still assessing the interaction pattern. You'll have them describe it. You don't get to witness it, but you know, humans are relatively predictable with some of this stuff. So you will be using this also with individuals to track their interpersonal um, patterns and to look at how they handle their attachment needs in relationships. The other important distinction and this approach, which you've heard me use, and I'll keep talking about it quite a bit, is a distinction between what's called primary emotions and secondary emotions. Now, in psychology, there's more than one theory that defines primary and secondary emotions. There are different theories that define it differently. So we're going to use the EFT definition for this um, approach. So the primary um, emotions um, are typically, you know, they're referring to your attachment emotions. And so secondary emotions are your emotions about the primary emotions. So you can get angry or you can be sad or you can be scared. But it, and so, but often those secondary emotions, right? If you're feeling threatened, you're feeling like you're not good you're, with your partner, you're not good enough. That'd be like the primary emotion. No matter what I do, I can't please you, right? And the secondary emotion might be anger is what you're gonna see on the surface. So secondary is often on the surface what people will verbally be describing usually when they walk in the room and that it is your job as the clinician to work with them to identify those primary emotions, which most of us don't describe when we talk about why we're upset about what just happened with our partner or family member. And most of us need some help to really even get to the right words to capture that. So um, in the early phase of therapy, I'm going to focus primarily on couples right here, is that what you're going to be doing is you're going to identify the negative interaction cycle. In fact, when I'm um, with working with couples, I will try to do this in the first session, get a little bit of history, but this pattern is, is really key. And so your first few sessions, you are looking at identifying, you know, what's going on when things... Um, you know, our homeostasis, things are normal. There isn't, there is not tension um, in the relationship. You know, how does tension escalate in the relationship? What are things like at their worst? And then how do things sort of get back to normal? Now, I will tell you as a couples therapist, this is one of the most important things to assess is how do things get back to normal? And you have one of two basic answers. One is at some point they're able to talk it through, hear each other, and get back to resolution. The other option is every you know everyone kind of you know sweeps it under the rug, and we agree to just move on, but we don't talk it through to where both people feel heard and understood. So when you do couples therapy, I'd say ninety percent of the time people are end up they're coming to couples therapy because they have been sweeping things under the rug. So hopefully in the beginning, most couples are able to talk things through, get some resolution. You have a few bad fights. People get more afraid to talk and express. And so things just get, start getting swept under the rug. And so, um, so what you're listening for when you're listening for that cycle, always pay attention to that. Every once in a while, you get a couple who can talk things through. It's almost like, why do you need me then? Um, but that's real important, you know, to understand, do they ever talk things through? And when was the last time they were able to do that in a relationship? Um, and so, so you start by assessing the pattern, and then you're identifying the primary and secondary emotions related to that negative cycle. And then, you know, as therapy progresses, the focus really goes on to um, identifying those primary attachment needs, as well as um, expressing those, receiving those, kind of having some emotionally corrective experiences around expressing those. And so 
Um, and that is really what the middle phase of therapy is focusing on. And so it's, um, okay, so what you're going to be looking for, um, and I love how Sue Johnson simplified this. So those of us who got trained in classic old systems theory, we could, we could have an infinite number of ways and roles in the cycle, one of which was pursue withdrawals, one of the classic first um, described interaction patterns in the field of couple and family therapy. Um, but when you think of most couple interaction patterns as who's to pursue or who's to withdraw, it just goes so much faster. And there are, of course, many ways to pursue and withdraw. So typically, so this is a classic pattern. Something happens in the couple relationship or family relationship or even a friendship, right? And the security, the sense of safety, right, gets um, shaken up. So the person who's more anxiously attached tends to pursue to reconnect because when they feel like the relationship is threatened, they immediately want to reconnect. Any threat is uncomfortable. So they immediately want to reconnect. And um, sometimes they do it in a soft, gentle way, but the most common way to pursue for connection. I hope you're sitting. I hope you're waiting for this. The most common way, da -da 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 -da, drum roll please, is to nag. It's the nagger. So whoever is nagging is often, is typically the pursuer. And they're trying to reconnect and kind of correct what they see as wrong, but they're still they're, they're moving towards the partner, which is why they're called the pursuer. So please don't think as if this is romantically pursuing someone. Oh, no, no. Typically, this, the pursuer is pursuing for reconnection, and it most often takes the form, sadly, of nagging. This is why humans, why do we do this to ourselves? We do. So we got to just have compassion for this is how humans tend to do it. So the withdrawer is the one who, when the relationship feels threatened and the pursuer comes to reconnect, they still feel scared and they kind of put up the wall and they distance themselves and they make themselves and make it harder to reconnect. And then what happens is the more the you know pursuer pursues, the more the withdrawer withdraws. And of course, the more they withdraw, the more there's pursuit. And then they create, they reinforce each other and create the negative downward spiral, as I like to call it, together. And so, but when you're in the middle of this, you're like, you are nagging. And the other one's like, because you are avoiding me, right? <laughs> And the way you subjectively experience it, it always feels like it's the other person who started it. It's the other person who caused this, you know, <laughs> reaction in me. And if you wouldn't do that, I wouldn't do this. If you wouldn't pursue, I wouldn't withdraw. If you wouldn't withdraw, I wouldn't pursue. And it's true. Yes, 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 and yes, and yes. And so that is where you as a clinician need to be able to hold that bigger perspective and to see the how the dance gets created together and it's all these little micro steps in the in the beginning it's all so tiny you can hardly tell that it's going on but before you know it you get into this negative cycle and it always feels like the other person started it and so um with pursuers um they're typically going to be expressing feelings such as being hurt unwanted um uncared for is Probably the, uh, you know, the attachment emotions will feel like typically the other person is not sincerely caring for who they are. You know, in contrast with the withdrawers, they're often feeling rejected, inadequate, judged, like no matter what I do, I am not good enough for you. Um, and so and the truth is, even identifying attachment uh, emotions, they are so universal that there's just variations on the theme of not being cared for and also not being good enough on the um, withdrawer side. So Sue identifies four basic interaction patterns, negative interaction patterns. Um, and by far the most common one is what we call pursue withdraw. And so this is where one partner, and it is typically the woman, is pursuing, typically looks like nagging. And the man, if in a heterosexual relationship, the man withdraws. So that's the most typical pattern um you will see the pursue withdraw also in emotionally abusive relationships in which case the pursuing is done typically by the person who would be considered physically or emotionally abusive so that's you'll see that pattern too but there's more of a power difference in, in those types of relationships another pattern you will see and this is not a good sign it's called the withdraw withdraw pattern and 
So this is where, where there's obviously something happened. There's tension in the relationship. Neither person pursues to reconnect. And so typically this was a pursue withdrawal relationship, but the pursuer has given up. And that's always bad when the pursuer gives up um, because it's really hard to save those. It's much harder to save those relationships. That, um, and I think this overlaps um, John Gottman's research on couples. He talks about the isolation and distance uh, cascade as predictive of marriage. And I think that overlaps with this withdraw, withdraw. There's isolation, there's distance. Neither one is pursuing to reconnect when tension happens. So, um, and, uh, you know, helping a, uh, getting a, a burned out pursuer to re-engage takes a lot of repair. And we'll talk about some more about that repair work. Um, it's usually an attachment injury that needs to be repaired when you see that type of pattern. So never, never a great pattern. And then we have attack, attack, just like it sounds. Um, so what this is, and this is often a more of an abusive pattern as well. You have the pursuer who is pursuing, often via nagging. And then the withdrawer at a certain point is like, I've had enough, turns around and they erupt into anger. And so then you end up with a much more aggressive attack pattern. And then you have the complex uh, cycles, which is usually characteristic of trauma. Um, and so this is a multiple, it, it's, it's a very complex cycle. And what's great about this, well, I don't know what's great about this one. Um, I mean, what happens in this one, the person who's pursuing and one withdraws and when the withdrawer tries to reconnect them who was pursuing, they turn around and they start withdrawing. You create this figure eight and I will tell you, when you get good at identifying this with couples, they all think you're psychic in the first session um, because they'll, you'll be like, you know, was, is there an un, untreated trauma? Is there any type of trauma history here? They're like, oh, how did you know? I'm like, oh, because you do the figure eight. Um, so, um, so, yeah. So, okay. So this is what the complex trauma looks like. Um so, so what happens here is person A, or let's, let's start with person A is pursuing, right? And person B withdraws. So they have that kind of normal um, pattern. And then what happens is person B at a certain point decides to kind of reconnect. And as soon as they reach out to reconnect and they're willing to reconnect, person A starts to withdraw. So these people will have a longer, um, a longer cycle of um, arguing and it's much more complex and like these arguments take a lot longer you, you will to spend a lot more time kind of tracking how these move so um so yeah so again this is a very complex um pattern and so when you see this type of thing it generally means that there's some trauma that also needs to be addressed in order to help a person be able to um, develop a sense of secure attachment. So, so the, so, so this pursue withdrawal is classically called the nag withdrawal because often nagging is used and there's clearly like stereotypes around that. Um, but the, the, the pursuing can take many different forms and men can do it, women can do it, you know, um, and, and so just be open minded for how that kind of pursuing it can feel like, you know, can we talk, honey? Can we talk? Can we talk? Can we talk? You know, that is another way that pursuing can look. It can be asking lots of questions is how pursuing can look, you know, um, and so can, pursuing can take lots of different forms. Classically in family therapy, they were it was also called the nag withdrawal cycle because it's the most common form that it takes. But be aware that the pursuing can take lots of different forms. Um, and so, um, but so noticing how each person can do it now, sometimes with some couples, one person is always the pursuer. One's always the distancer. And in other couples that they can do the same basic dance moves, but it goes in total reverse and they switch positions. So you can also have that type of pattern. Um, that you're looking at with couples. So there, there are different ways that this can all happen. And each couple has its own unique way of doing this. And so your job as the clinician is to figure out what the pursuing looks like, you know, and what the distancing looks like. And normally I'll try to use the words that both members of the couple agree upon to, to, um, to label whatever the 
pursuing is or whatever the distancing is, you know, they can be putting up walls. It could be, you know, the um, wanting to reconnect or whatever language they use. Some couples choose to use the word nagging and I'll go with that if that's what they want to, you know, if they're both good with that. Um, but finding the correct word for what pursue and withdraw is for that couple that they can both agree on. And then your job as the clinician is to really understand those uh, dance moves. So if you didn't know, Sue Johnson does do formal ballroom dance. And so she uses the dance metaphor quite a bit. A bit. So, uh, so another real important thing to assess um, as early as humanly possible um, when working with couples is what we call attachment injuries. You can obviously have this also in family systems. And an attachment injury is a very specific type of betrayal. And it's it's when in a moment of extreme vulnerability, like being pregnant, right? Um, one partner reaches for the other and there the other partner is not there in this moment of extreme vulnerability. I needed you, right? In this moment, very desperately, and you weren't there. And that type of... Um, and that type of betrayal or attachment injury means it is really hard for me to trust you again. And so when you have attachment injuries, um, you need to go back and repair those first. And, you know, a common form of attachment injury is infidelity. Um, during pregnancy, there can be a lot of attachment injuries uh, just because, you know, the pregnant partner can often be far more needy and the other partner can may not quite catch on to the level of need. Um, so you'll see uh, it can be around family of origin, um, you know, when you align with the family against the partner. So there are lots of different moments in a couple's relationship where there can be an attachment injury. And, and so you want to assess those as, and try to identify those usually they bubble to the surface, but if you ever find that you're working with a couple and you just can't like get them to move forward, go back and look for a moment where really one person felt very betrayed or abandoned by the other. Um, and, and sometimes they didn't talk about it. If they've been together for 30 years, sometimes they don't mention whatever it seems so far in the past, um, but make sure this is really key, and we will talk about there are actually a very specific protocol for dealing with these attachment injuries. And of course, these can happen with children when they feel like they needed their parent and their parent wasn't there. But these you need to address very specifically and to do specific repair work on these attachment injuries in order to recreate a sense of safety in the relationship. There are some contraindications for EFT. So you don't just, you know, use EFTs. Couples come in, you don't that necessarily use it um, for, with everyone. So one common place is if they're really different agendas where one person is um, for, for therapy and for the relationship in general. Like if one person is like, I don't know if I want to be in this relationship, right? <laughs> um, or one wants to marry, one wants to be single, you, you know, they have different agendas for the relationship. This is not a good time to do EFT if the end goal isn't even agreed upon. Um, please, for the love of God, separating when couples are in the middle of divorce, I, I don't know why I've had several of my clients who have been seeing individually, sometimes they're these therapists who are trying to do couples therapy. It's like, no, there's divorce therapy. If you're in the middle of a divorce, you know, do divorce therapy or do couples therapy. They are different things. <laughs> and so if, if one person has decided to leave, this is not a good time to whip out EFT and try to repair attachments. I mean, that, that's just very confusing. I, yeah, I had one client where the therapist was trying to go back and repair every attachment injury, like during this relatively high conflict divorce. I'm like, this is just, this was, it, it was not having good psychological in outcomes for my poor client. So when there is abu an abusive relationship um, that typically you would not be using EFT, there are some exceptions. It's a whole different lecture, but generally if there's, you know, any type of physical, sexual, or emotional abuse going on, um, and you would not necessarily jump to EFT. You really need to assess whether or not it's um, appropriate. And then also with untreated addiction, if you have someone who has an addiction um, and doesn't want to get it treated, you know, it's kind of in denial about it. That may also be an indication um, that they're not appropriate. So let's look at goal setting. 
So goal setting in EFT is relatively uh, straightforward. We're going to create secure attachment between uh, for both partners. Um, we're going to develop, you know, healthy interaction patterns that really nurture and support each person. And a lot of that is just increasing each person's ability to identify and express in healthy ways their uh, emotions, particularly their attachment needs.